want you to find a Bible. If you didn't perhaps bring one with you, there should be one in uh, the chair rack or the pew rack in front of you or near you. And I want you to find John's Gospel, chapter 16. And we're going to take up with verse 16 and read all the way to verse 33. And it's a rather lengthy passage. We'll read that together in a moment. While you're looking for that, Jesus about to go to be with His Father, ascend is the word that we use to describe that event. Matthew, one of the twelve disciples, records these words in Matthew 28 and 19 and following. Um, He says that you and I, as we go, we are to make disciples. And that that M-A-K-E, just it just thumped me this week. You ever get one of those like, oh my gosh, I, that word make, what, what does it look like? How much does it weigh? What does it feel like? How do, I, how do I evaluate if I am a disciple maker? Years ago, I heard someone give this definition of a disciple. A disciple is one who is continuing to learn, continuing to learn, We are continuing to learn about Jesus as a person, as a person. So let's read these verses together and keep that in mind that you and I as Christians have an obligation, but it's not an obligation that's a burden, it's a blessing, it's a joy. We ought to be rejoicing that we're saved and we have good news to share. In fact, I hope I will tell you this again, but the gospel means this. You are loved more than you could ever imagine. Isn't that amazing that God loves us? And that's, that's what the world needs to hear. The, the world doesn't know that, and the world being those that have not yet experienced the love of God through the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. They're loved in spite of their sin, in spite of their anger, in spite of their hatred, in spite of their actions. They are loved more than they could ever imagine. In fact, the Bible says it like this. In the fact that while you and I were still sinners, we hadn't experienced Jesus, Christ died for us. What a tremendous love story. But let me tell you a problem for Christians. And Jesus is not bashful in talking about the fact that as Christians, you and I are going to have problems. So let's read and listen to see what he has to say about suffering or persecution. Reading with me from John's Gospel, chapter 16, beginning with verse 16. He says, a little while and you will no longer see me. Again, a little while and you will see me. Therefore, some of the disciples said one to another, What is this that he tells us? A little while you will not see me, and a little while you will see me. And, he says, because I am going to the Father. What is this that he's saying? A little while. We don't know what he's talking about. Jesus knew. I apologize. I'm having to adjust because I'm talking and that's making noise. Jesus knew they wanted to question him. So he said, are you asking one another about what I said? A little while and you will not see me, and a little while you will see me. I assure you. Now, this is that place of problems, Jesus writes. You will weep and wail. Keith, you want to come and help me adjust this? Because the more I talk, the worse it gets, which I'm used to. So as Jesus is talking, he's telling his disciples, I'm going to, I am with you, I'm about to leave you, you'll see me again, but in the meantime, there's going to be some suffering, some persecution, some weeping and wailing. The reason I'm talking is it's a test, instead of standing up here saying, test, one, two, three, okay? Thank you, Keith. All right, we'll try better and see if that doesn't work for us. Verse 20. I assure you, this is a promise from Jesus, you will weep and you will wail, but the world will rejoice. You will become sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because her time has come. But when she has given birth to a child, she... Now look at this. Isn't this great? She doesn't remember the suffering because of the joy that a person has been born into this world, Nikki. 
So you also have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Your hearts will rejoice, and no one or no thing will rob you of your joy. In that day, you will not ask me anything. I assure you, ask the Father in my name, and he will give you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be complete. I have spoken these things to you in figures of speech. A time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name. I'm not telling you that I will make requests to the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I am leaving the world and going to the Father. Ah, said the disciples, now you're speaking plainly and not using any figurative language. Now we know that you know everything and don't need to question anyone but you. By this we believe you came from God. Jesus responded to them and said, Do you now believe? Look, an hour is coming and has come when each of you will be scattered to his own home and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you these things so that you, that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, speak to us now by your Holy Spirit. Help us, Lord, to take to heart what it means where Jesus says that we are to make disciples. This we pray in his strong name. Amen. What does it mean to make a disciple? Well, it is to carry love into a world that's experiencing hatred. Did you ever think you'd live in a day and a time where people are put into cages and set a fire and that you could watch that on the nightly news? The horrors of humanity. But we are to love in a world that's experiencing hatred. Not only are we to love in a a world that's experiencing hatred, we're supposed to have joy. Joy in a world experiencing sorrow. How how can that be? It's complex, if not confusing, that we are to be loving in a world that is experiencing hatred, and we can have joy in a world that is sorrowing. And Jesus even goes on to say that you and I, as Christians, not may have peace, but do have peace in a world that's filled with turmoil. I was listening online recently to a gentleman that I like to listen to preach. His name is Sinclair Ferguson, and he said this concerning making disciples. He said, for the Christian, you and I need to understand, for the Christian, we, we begin to do things naturally or natural things in a spiritual way. So there's no distinction, there's no separation between what we're doing and who Christ is to us. Do natural things spiritually and do spiritual things naturally. Jesus ought to come to uh, our mind and to our mouth as we talk to people. The word some people use is we ought to salt our conversation. We ought to season our conversation with people. That not only is Jesus the Lord, He is our Lord, and that they need to know Because he loves them more than they could ever imagine. But let me tell you about those people for just a moment. Those that are not Christians. The Bible says of them they have experienced death. They are dead in trespass and sin. Their nature. Their nature is in antagonism towards God. They are dead. They are bound because of their nature to death. They're physically alive. They're spiritually dead. Not only are they dead in trespasses and sin, just contrast, they are loved more than they could ever imagine. They are destined to a far worse experience than they could ever imagine. And they're powerless to change. They are absolutely powerless to change. It would be like this if you were ever in jail 
And I hope that you don't arrive there soon. But the jailer being careless, you're, you're there, you're uh, confiscated, you have, uh, they take away your belt and your shoelaces so that you don't do harm to yourself. You're in jail, you're awaiting either sentencing or sentencing has taken place and the jailer comes along and you would love to be someplace else, you would love to have your freedom back and there you are in jail, you're behind closed doors and the jailer comes along and he takes the key that unlocks your door and the next door and the next door and the next door until you would be free on the curb and he intentionally leaves it in the lock. You are in jail, you would love to be free, and the key is there, the door is there, and the jailer leaves, and you are powerless, absolutely powerless to reach out there through the bars, turn that key, escape the cell, go down the hall, I'm speaking from experience, open that door, open the next door, and find yourself on the street and in the sunlight. You are powerless. Why are you powerless? Because if you are not a Christian, you are destined to destruction and you are dead in sin. But good news. Those people are loved more than they could ever, ever imagine. I read recently in Great Britain, London... Uh, they move themselves around that great city in something called the tube. It's a, a railroad. Sometimes it goes above ground and sometimes it goes below ground. And there was a man on the tube recently. And uh, he was standing there and another man came as a passenger and was pushing people and being very profane. And he just pushed his way through and actually shoved this man, pushed on a lady and said bad things about their mother and their father and their own nature. And so the man saw this man's face, and later in the day, the man that was pushed is the uh, HR person, the human resource person for a company there that had applicants coming in for interviews, and uh, he was awaiting his next client to interview to possibly hire, when guess who came through the door? That man. That man. What would you do if you were that person? And you had the power to affect their life. Well, I know at times in my life I'd have told them who I was, remind them where we'd met, and suggest they go someplace else to take their attitude and their actions and go in God's speed. But the Bible says that you and I to love that person, to love that person, to, to somehow engage and involve yourself with them so that you have an opportunity to tell them, they are loved more than they could ever imagine. That's why you've got that little card. It's, it will serve as a reminder of their situation. George Washington Bridge is located in New York City, and periodically people get on the precipice of that bridge and jump to their death. They, uh, they commit suicide. Why do people do that? Oh, uh, circumstances, disease affects their mind, their body, a broken relationship, a loss of fortune, they're homeless, whatever, whatever their story is. But you see, the people in New York City have determined that that's not a good thing to have people jumping off of your bridge and dying. So two officers, Jess Torano, T-U-R-A-N-O, and Brandon, M-U-L-D-E-R-I-G-G. Spelled just like I sound, it's, it's spelled just like I said it. Recently, those two men have been involved in the prevention of 12 people from jumping to their death. Can you imagine? That's your job. You put on your uniform. You go out. You get the call. You rush out to the George Washington Bridge because there's someone who is balancing over the edge. And this last week... One more person, a 37-year-old, and these two officers got close enough to get hold of him to pull him back. And while being interviewed, what's it like to do that kind of work? To bring people back from, if you would, the edge of death. One of these officers said these words, and they ought to be our words. I couldn't stand the thought of him dying while I was there. Look at the people that... You pass by in life. Look at your family. Look at your friends. Some of the people that you know and that, that, that you would find it hard to talk to about Jesus, unless Christ becomes real in their life, they are destined for eternal separation. 
What kind of a love do we say that we have if we don't open our mouths and tell them? Uh, One great historian, theologian, said concerning man's experience, he said, to a person who is not a Christian, their life is turned inward. And he said, to a Christian who's experienced Christ in their heart, their life must be turned outward. And stop living for ourselves and living for others. In fact, William Booth, I think was the name that I recall, was the first leader of the Salvation Army. And one Christmas season, trying to motivate and inspire his people not to ring the bell, not to get the prophet in the pot, but to tell people that they were loved, a one-word telegram went out at Christmas time, and it was the word, others. To quit living for ourselves and start living for others. It's, it's interesting how people are named. Our families choose to name us for whatever reason. There is a man in the world alive today... And his name is Good Luck. That's his first name. How would you like, you know, Good Luck. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that when mother and father received Good Luck into the world, what they were wishing for him was a, a wonderful life. His name is Good Luck Jonathan. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Every place you go, what you, I'm Good Luck Jonathan. I mean, it's just an interesting aside. He happens to be the president of one of the countries in Africa. And it is said of him he's a Christian. Now, having traveled the world just a little bit, it's interesting because you see in some countries, if a person is born into a family, that's what they call themselves to be. In other words, if a son was born to a Muslim mother and father, that son is destined to be a Muslim. He doesn't get to choose. And the same thing is true in some countries where they're born to people who call themselves Christians. So it says in his bio that good luck Jonathan is a Christian. He is the president of Nigeria. Do you know anything about Nigeria right now? Nigeria is being affected by Boko Haram. And not too long ago, that violent force came into the country and took 200 young women and small girls and carried them away to a most horrible experience. When Good Luck Jonathan was asked about that, he's running for office again. He's the president of Nigeria. This is what he said. He said, I never imagined that Boko Haram would do what they would do. What a naive statement. We ought not to be amazed or surprised when the children of the devil do devilish things. And so what we have to do is not resist them. The Bible says resist the devil and he will flee from you. How do we know that we can make a difference, not a difference, the difference? Go back with me and read John chapter 16, verses 16 and following. There's a a word that I use to describe what Jesus was saying. He said, I'm going to go away and I'm going to go to the Father. And the disciples were, like you or I, scratching their head, if you would, figuratively. They were puzzled by, what does he mean? He was describing a death, his own death. But in describing his death, he was promising that he would return to them and that they would be with him. I'd call that a promise. A promise. Jesus has promised something. And it's, it's not conditioned on you or I. It is conditioned on his good name. God has given you and I a promise. If we will ask, Jesus says in here, if we will ask in His name, God will give us what we ask for. I must confess to you, I'm infrequent in asking God for souls. Oh, I'll pray for you when you're sick. I do. I love to pray when you're, for you when you're sick. I don't love it when you're sick. That's why I pray that you'll be healed. But let's understand that Jesus has made a promise. So, if it is conditioned on His Word, not our Word, His Word is not just He left us with a Word, but the other thing I see about Jesus is His presence. Is His presence. I hope that you're familiar with Romans chapter... What chapter is it where He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you? What chapter is it that says... All things work together for good to them that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. 
He is... He has told us in advance that He will come into us, indwell us, and fill us. We have that on His promise, and we have experienced His presence. But Jesus also said to His disciples, Are you His disciple? That you will have problems. You will have problems. Now, let's be serious about this for a moment. Some problems... I'm hesitant to say this word because I got my mouth washed out and probably the third or fourth grade were saying it in school. I still remember the taste of the soap and I doubt that they've improved. Somebody ought to make peppermint soap that tastes like peppermint, chocolate soap that tastes like chocolate, not what I had. But sometimes our problems are because we do stupid things. They're stupid. Why'd you do that? Have you ever been asked that? Why'd you do that? It was stupid, wasn't it? And then we suffer because of it. We suffer. So hopefully you've matured beyond stupidity. But there's a possibility there are some situations where after the fact you go, wow, I'm suffering. Why are you suffering? I got to tell you, I did something stupid. It's like how many of you have lived in your house for more than one night and you get up and walk through your room in the dark and you discover the edge of the bed or the door with the toe, your toe. Why didn't you turn the light on? Well, I I didn't want to disturb. So you'd rather suffer. Okay, That's, that's stupid, isn't it? There are some situations. Some situations are what we would call circumstance. We didn't do anything. We we just happened to be there. I don't want you to understand that you're the victim because the world is filled with circumstances, isn't it? And Jesus is offering us peace by his presence. That's a promise. But I want you to hear this. Jesus said that you and I would have situations that would cause us to suffer because we're Christians. Have you ever been persecuted, experienced suffering? I hate to reminisce sometimes. I really do. Uh, But I would, uh, as God is my witness, tell you a story. I was called to a church in East Texas. It's still there. And uh, I was the 43rd pastor in 107 years. Do some math. That means that uh, about every two, two and a half years, they got a new pastor. I was the ninth pastor in 20 years. And I figured out after a while, it wasn't just me. They don't like preachers. Or they like them so much that they just can't get enough of them. Anyway, my wife and I had traveled from East Texas to Jackson, Wyoming to be at my grandmother's 80th birthday, which was a family reunion. It was a wonderful family time. I got to see cousins that I I only saw infrequently. In fact, some of them I haven't seen since 1980. It was a wonderful time. But while I was there, the phone rang. Predate cell phone, if you can imagine that. And the phone rang, and I had a friend at that church tell me that they'd had a business meeting Sunday night in my absence. It wasn't scheduled, but they decided to have it. The background of the story went something like this. When I got there, I'm a person of some detail, and I began to look at how the church operated, and I discovered that they didn't have a constitution and bylaws. And I mentioned that to some of the leaders, and they said, we don't want that, we don't want that. When I told them, if they're operating without a constitution bylaws, and you haven't submitted it to the Secretary of State, when the IRS audits your taxes, the the deduction you take for giving to the church, it's not recognized. What are you talking about, preacher? Well, you have to be, the way we work in America, to be a church, you have to be a not-for-profit corporation. Oh, we better take care of that. And they pulled out a constitution that they'd written, but they'd never voted into place. So they had one. I didn't write it. I just let them to vote on it. It said in that constitution, they wrote it. I didn't. Remember, they were good at removing pastors. It said it took a 75% majority to remove a pastor. So while I was on vacation... They had a business meeting in my absence, not because I'd been immoral, not because I'd done anything with their money, not because I was preaching heresy, but it was right at that two-year time. In fact, it was two and a half years. They had a business meeting in my absence. They couldn't get a 75% majority to fire the pastor because there were people that were there who were saying, this isn't right, this is ungodly, this is unholy, we need to stop this. 
And one of them reminded the group that they could do what they wanted with a simple majority of 51%. So while they couldn't fire me, I got a phone call on a Monday. They'd had a business meeting in my absence. And they, my friend was informing me. They said, we want you to come back. But the church voted last night to cut your pay and benefits in half. Oh, praise God. As I learned to say in the South, bless my heart. So Jesus has told us of His promise and He has told us of His presence. But He also tells us of His problems. That was in 1984. Somebody do the math, but that's not quite, but almost 30 years. You know what I've been doing since that church? Oh, they didn't fire me. To this day, I've gone back. I've run across some of them. Not literally, but, you know, I've, I've encountered them. And you know what they say? Oh, we loved you, Brother Tim. We, do you realize we didn't fire you? Well, if that's love, don't love me like that anymore. It created a problem. But it wasn't just a problem for me. It was a problem in the community because the community that had a hard heart and was destined for hell said they did it again. Now, I want to tell you about that church ever so quickly. That that church owns its own building. It's debt-free. It takes just enough offering in to hire somebody to come and preach. But I've done some checking. Do you know what they haven't been doing? Winning souls. Day by day, the people grow older and older and older. And one of these days, unless God gets hold of those people, do you know what will happen to that place that they call themselves a church? problems here's the solution to the problem to love the world as jesus loves the world jesus says in the midst of your suffering and your sorrow let it because you are doing good i mean how many of you have bought a car whether it was new or used and you go out in the parking lot and somebody's put a a a friendly reminder that they were nearby they either hit you with their door or they took keys out of their pocket and they went down the side You weren't even there. You don't know this person. You never did anything to them. You just happen to share space in this world today. That's a small problem. I mean, it's an expensive problem if you go to a paint and body shop and have to have it restored. How many of you have ever been lied to? How many of you have ever been robbed? How many of you have ever been assaulted? You're going to have problems. Jesus says, peace is not an improvement of your circumstance. Peace is knowing His presence. And if He's present, you want to tell people about Him. If you're living inward, you're thinking of yourself. If you're living outward, you're talking about Him. And Jesus says, look, look right up here. In, well, it's up here in my Bible. Verse 24. Jesus says of Himself to his, those disciples, Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask now and you will receive. And look what it says. That your joy may be complete. Here's what's happening to a person who calls themselves a Christian but doesn't share Jesus with other people. This is my diagnosis. A person who was unwilling to share the gospel of Jesus with another person is a person who fails to forgive. Fails to forgive. We uh, would do well to look in Matthew chapter 6, that little section that we call the Lord's Prayer. Right after that, there's a little formula about forgiveness. It says you're forgiven... To the degree, the amount, the time, the quality, the quantity, as you forgive. When we quit sharing Jesus and we aren't concerned about other people going to heaven with us, we have failed to forgive. And a person that fails to forgive is also a person that fails to give. Now, it's one thing the Bible says about your money. Yeah, the preacher's talking about your money. I'd suggest if you look at your credit card receipts or your checkbook... There will be an indication of how you're spending your money. If it's all on you and none on others, and you call yourself a Christian, 
You've got a problem with Jesus because Jesus has asked us to give. Now hear this. Not just our material possessions, but to give His love away. I can't blow balloons up. You would be as surprised, as full of hot air as I am, that I, I have never mastered. I've probably blown up maybe 10 or 20 balloons in my whole life. That's not a big thing, but, you know, I like to be successful. But what happens if you put a balloon, uh, put more in the balloon than it was designed to hold? It'll blow up. I remember, I think I've told you this, I rode into a, a, a service station. I had a, a new bike, and it had a low tire. And some of you remember you could put air in a bicycle back then because it had a, it had a meter on there, and you'd, you'd set the, the air pressure. And I, I didn't think about the consequence. I cranked that to 85 PSI. I touched that to the valve stem on that tire, and it went off like a rocket right next to my head. I was laying on the sidewalk next to my bicycle wondering, what happened? Well, I happened, okay? I know that a bicycle only takes about 20 to 22 pounds of pressure. Something is going to give if you fail to give. You will fail to forgive. Not only do you fail to forgive and you fail to give, you fail to go. You fail to go. Jesus says, as you go, make disciples. Put your hands in your pockets, sit on them, whatever. But have you ever had that moment with someone where they said yes to Jesus for the first time? Do you have that in your experience? If not, why not? Ask God to give you that soul. I mean, it is a highlight. You'll, you, you'll not wait to get around other Christians and say, guess what God let me see? I was involved in a, in a new birth. If you fail to forgive and fail to give and fail to go, you fail to care. That business meeting, I wasn't there, but I had friends tell me in tears, the man facilitating the business meeting said, we're going to do this business meeting. And he held up the constitution and bylaws of the church. Remember? They didn't want one. Now that he had one, he knew how to use it. I'm not going to tell you his name. But he is quoted as saying, he held up the constitution. And one dear little young lady, young lady, who is new to being a Christian, stood up with tears streaming down her face. This is what I'm told. And she held up her Bible where she had just discovered how much she was loved. This is happening in what is called a church. She is holding up the Bible and says, what about this? And that man, who'd been the Sunday school director in that church for 42 years, I quote, he said, I don't care what that says. It's a pretty serious indictment, isn't it? You would never say anything like that. You would never stand up and be that kind of a person. Can I suggest to you that you and I are no different than he was on that day? If we can leave this place and tell the world basically we don't care, you can go to hell. Do you know what would stop the jihadists? They don't need a jobs bill from the United States. They need Jesus. Do you know what will cause a transformation of the worst of characters? Only the power of Jesus. Can you imagine saying to a tender, innocent, young church member, as a man who'd been in that church a long time, holding up a document that was affirmed by the state of Texas and saying, this is our guide and not the Word of God. The Word of God is Jesus. He is a person. If you know Him, that little, that little card, that little card, that could be the difference maker in someone's destiny. Let's pray. Father, help us, Lord. Help us to find good and godly examples. Help us to, to rest in Your promises and to live in your presence. 
and to understand that we are going to suffer in life, but let it be for doing good. And there is no greater good than to tell people that Jesus is Lord. Lord and Savior, King of kings, Lord of glory. He's my friend. And when I tell people that, your word says about that feeling that I have in my heart. There's a peace that is beyond description. Well, I recognize that Jesus has saved me, and I rejoice when I tell someone those words. We pray in the strong name of Jesus that we would take seriously the sin of the world and recognize that you will be a Savior to them that believe in the name and the person of Jesus. This we pray in His name. Amen. Stand together as we sing. The invitation is open. If you're here and you're a Christian, we would welcome you to unite with this church. If you'll come, I'll explain to you what I will call the the terms of that agreement. And um, if you're just here today and you need some prayer and counsel, you'll come and come quickly as others sing. Have thine own name.